Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Um, for those who don't know, my name's uh, Joe Grabowski. I'm the founder of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And yeah, the whole point of this organization is to connect classrooms with um, adventure, with science, and conservation projects from around the world. So I'm very excited today to be with uh, Greg Trinish. He uh, was a National Geographic Explorer of the Year in 2008. He was an emerging explorer as well, um, and he's the founder of Adventures and Scientists for Conservation. So, Greg, how you doing? Good. Thanks so much for having me. All right. So we have Greg's going to take over in just a moment, but I want to introduce our classrooms joining in. We've got Mr. Greenfield's class, some grade fives from Freehold, New Jersey. I'll turn your mic on so you can give it a little wave. Say hi, guys. Hi. All right. We also have my group here. We're from Guelph, Ontario. These are grades six, seven, or grade seven. And then there's a group, Mrs. Graham's class from Jonesville, Virginia. They're just having some speaker troubles, so hopefully they're able to join us uh, partway through. I'll just turn on the mic. And back. Can you hear us, guys? Uh, no dice yet. All right. Well, hopefully it comes in. So. Greg, I'll let you take over. I know you have a, a little bit you'd like to talk to the classes about, then we'll do a little Q&A. All right, that sounds good. Hey, guys, how's it going? Oh, well, well, good anyway. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, thanks so much for uh, listening. I'm going to share a little bit about uh, some of my expeditions with you and some of my work, and uh, then we'll go from there. Uh, and like... Uh, they said well, we're going to have some questions afterwards, so if you hold your questions till then. Um, how do I share my screen here? Let me just make sure that's happening. All right. And it should be sharing now. We got it. Cool. All right. So I've had the privilege to travel and explore all around the world, and one of my biggest expeditions was down the length of South America. So on this journey, I walked for 667 days, or just under two years, 22 months. I covered five countries. These were Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. And I estimated the trip to be about 7,800 miles. So that's the same as if we left from where I live in Bozeman, Montana, and we walked all the way to California. And then we walked all the way back across the country to New York. And then we walked all the way back across the country to Montana. So this is quite a long way. It's also the same as if you walked from the country Ecuador all the way up to Alaska. So quite a long way. And along the way, I had incredible challenges. I faced difficulties of traveling off trail. Oftentimes we were away, away, alone in the woods or away from trail for days on end. And we had bushwhacking like that. In this case, we spent four days crossing what's called turba, or peat bogs. So this is on the southern end of the continent of South America. And along the way, despite facing so much journey, I was so privileged to see and experience the beauty of these places that I was in. Greg, you know, if I can just, sorry, interrupt for just a moment. Yeah. Your um, camera seems to have dropped. Let me just see if it's... Well, I'm on full screen here on my... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, we had your image, but... Oh, there, you're back. Good. Okay. And so I'm on a full screen now. So can you still see the presentation now? Let's see. Um, if you want to try and go through a slide... Yep. So I'll come right back now. to you we see looks like a close-up of maybe an alpaca or a vacuna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. vacuna. Okay, well, let's keep going then. It's back. All right, cool. So along the way, despite facing so much challenge and so many obstacles, I was also able to see incredible views and encounter incredible wildlife like these vicuña and Wanaco along the way. I fell in love with the wildlife of South America, and something that was with me throughout that entire journey was something that was first with me on the Appalachian Trail. And so this is a trek that goes from Georgia all the way up to Maine through 14 states, including New Jersey and uh, Virginia as well. And along the way, about halfway through in Pennsylvania, 
I had fallen on these rocks that you see in the picture here for 15 or 16 straight times, and it just became excruciatingly painful, and it wore me down over and over again, and I hit one of my low points that I've ever had on my expeditions in this very moment. So I picked up one of these rocks, and I chucked it at a tree in frustration and took a big chunk out of the tree and just started crying. I felt like I was doing something that wasn't benefiting the world, something really selfish that was only for me. And I vowed in that moment that I would continue, fin finish the trail and, and uh, complete what I had set out to do, but that I would make a difference with my time outside. And so that led to expeditions similar to the treks that I had previously taken, but they were now about a purpose. They had the meaning be like putting myself in the brain of a grizzly bear or a wolverine as I moved from the eastern side of Yellowstone to the western side of the Frank Church in Idaho. Uh, to document what's called infringements to wildlife connectivity, or so for the ability for wildlife to move across large landscapes. And out west, where I live, this is Greg, a really important thing. Sorry, but, Greg, can I pause you for one more second? Can you just try and um, go back to what you did before when you weren't sharing full screen? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if the presentation will work then, though. There we go. Now try just moving to the next slide. Right, but my, it won't work. My transitions and stuff are all built in, and multiple slides have multiple layers to them, so you won't be able to see all the okay. slides. Um, I think, though, we might have to do it this way, just because, for whatever reason, when you go to full screen, it freezes. It freezes. Uh-oh. Oh. Okay. Um, Try moving to another slide from the one... Uh, you're at the one where across the Rockies, right, with the bear and the wolverine? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then if you just hit down to the next one. Right, but <laughs> I have I layers on top of them, Joe, so it's not going to – it won't show the slides because it will skip slides. But I can wing it with that if that's what we have to do. I think so. For whatever reason – is this Keynote, I think, maybe? Yeah. Let me, uh, let me try sharing the screen in a different way. Let me sure. try this. All right. We'll see if this works any better. Um, all right, so how's this? Is it still frozen now? No, we can see it nice now. Okay, great. Try so, moving the slide, though, just in case. Oh, yeah, there we go. We got it. Good. All right, cool. So the purpose of that journey and the purpose of my expeditions after I found this purpose was to really learn about wildlife and how wildlife move across large landscapes. So I learned to track grizzly bears and wolverines. And I went out collecting things like this, which is just a little specimen of hair that you can barely see in my hand there. I went to Mongolia with National Geographic on a similar expedition in 2013. And I put myself again in the brain of a wolverine, but our goal was to go down this frozen landscape, to go across these frozen rivers and frozen streams in an ecosystem that gets to be negative 40 degrees in the winter. And we were searching for a population of wolverine in some of the most excruciating and difficult conditions I had ever seen. I expected on this trip that I would see maybe one wolverine track the entire way, but on the very first day, just a mere few minutes out of camp, we found this, our first set of tracks here. And you can see very beautifully that there's five toes on a wolverine, and we have a really clear one-two-one one pattern. So the patterns really tell us a lot when we look at tracking mammals we can look at their track pattern, we can look at the width of their track and the length of their track that really tell us a lot. This particular track was really, really exciting because as we had gone to Mongolia, we had heard that maybe 40 years earlier, there was this creature there. And When I saw this track, I started jumping up and down with my skis on and fell over 10 or 15 times because I was so excited about this thing. And uh, this track in particular, it has four toes, it has no claws that show up in the toe, and it has a really big inner digital pad. The inner digital pad is like the palm of our hands. And that told me right away that this was a cat. And there's only two cats that this could possibly be. One of those is a lynx, and a lynx has all kinds of hair underneath its foot, and so it wouldn't have shown up so clearly. And a, uh, the other is a snow leopard. And so with this individual photo, we expanded the known range of snow leopards, which had been extinct in this area for 40 years, and we showed that, in fact, they weren't extinct, but rather extant, meaning that they are still there. 
So all of this biological expeditioning or these expeditions that really were making a difference for science, it combined my two passions. I had a passion for adventure and I had a passion for science. And along with that, I had always searched for the way that I as an individual in the world can make a difference. And so I started Adventurers and Scientists for Conservation in 2011, which allowed me to imagine a world in which reliable scientific information was no longer a limiting factor for conservation. So under the mission to explore, collect, and protect, we now send adventurers all around the world looking for different scientific information. I'm going to skip, well, Joe, interrupt me if this video is choppy at all. Is that coming through all right? Yeah, it looks okay. Natalie Kerwald is working over in Venice, Italy, and her research is all about understanding how quickly glaciers are thinning throughout the world. Something that's really new about my work is that I'm able to show that glaciers are melting, losing mass, at elevations even as high as 6,000 meters above sea level, which is about 20,000 feet above sea level. This is important because we don't know how much fresh water exists in the world. And glaciers essentially are a big reservoir of fresh water. Some areas of the central Himalaya, for example, where Jeremy was, provides water for a minimum of half a billion people, and it could be up to two billion people. I'm uh, taking snow samples for this climate study. My final samples came after this, like, 12-hour day up at high elevation and just to dig a pit at that elevation and get down deep within the glacier to get the proper samples. It takes some time to dig down about six feet and every like foot and a half we'll come in uh, and take snow samples and send them to Italy where they're doing study at the University of Venice. My science teacher from high school that I barely passed. I'd be very happy to know that I um, was part of a science experiment. <laughs> so under this organization we have guys like Jeremy who are traveling all around the world and I get to continue traveling as well. One of the projects I did with National Geographic was out in Botswana. So Botswana is in southern Africa and my mission there was to set up these sensors. So the green thing there is a $35 Raspberry Pi unit. So that's like a miniature computer. And believe it or not, it does everything that your Mac can do. And the white thing at the bottom of the case there is a cellular modem, which allows us to transmit the data in real time up to and through cellular towers. This is Shaw Selby, another National Geographic Explorer. He's an engineer who built all this stuff. And it's all powered by solar panels, we pound it into the base of the delta, and then we set off polling in these 16-foot dugout canoes called Makoros to our next site. We can drink the water right from the delta because all of the grasses that are there act like a giant uh, filtration system. And so as we're going through this area, we have to navigate through these grasses as well. And it's not always easy to do. We strap on harnesses and sometimes with six people we'll carry these 450 pound Makoros when there's no water across dry grass and it can be excruciatingly hot in the middle of the delta. All the trails that we're following, and they're not really trails, they're more paths that have been carved out by elephants and hippos. And as we go deeper and deeper into the wilderness we start to see things like this. So that's my foot with a giant elephant poop. And my foot is size 13, so that is a really giant turd. As we go deeper and deeper into the wilderness, we get to see not just the signs of the animals, but we get to see the animals themselves. Herds of 50 plus elephants, and as I walked around the islands, which are made from termites, in the mornings I'd see elephants come and greet me. We got to see hippos clashing with elephants in the middle of the delta. And we get to see things like this, which are more scary than they are fun to see. So that's a crocodile. It's about 20 feet long, or 16 feet long, rather. And that's shot with a GoPro just hanging over the edge of those Makoros, or the boats. The hippos are massive. These are two-tongued creatures, and they're considered some of the most dangerous in Africa. Our initial strategy was to try to scare these things. 
by hitting sticks on the water like this. But when you try to scare a two-tongued creature, it just goes into the water and sinks down, and then its buddies come. And so where there was one, we started having others pop up above the water. Slowly but surely, there were 22 of these things right in front of us, and the one in the bigger upper right-hand corner with the giant massive head, that's the male bull. That's the one that gets out of the water and mere feet away from us, storms up, and so he's just 15 feet away, mouth wide open and screaming at us, Rawr! letting us know that he doesn't like so much that we're there. But as we navigate through these hippos, we have a ton of respect for him. This is their land, and we're in their waters. And so every day we're so thankful to have made it through that we all hug it out at the end of the day, and we set up camp, and we'd have lions and all kinds of different things walking through our camp as we set up these big fires to let them know that we're there. We get to hang out with the Baie'i people. So these are the guides on the trip, and these guys have known this land, and they've lived in these areas for their entire lives, and they take us through, and at night... This is Tom, the music man, and he's got what's called a saworo. So the saworo is just a bent reed, and he's got a, uh, you know, the reed that's on his thumb there is just from papyrus grasses. And he uses a stick that he rubs along the bottom to make vibrations and then opens and closes his mouth to make this sound here. So every night, I would play harmonica, and Tom, the music man, would play the saguaro. Pretty incredible. We get to walk around these islands and experience these islands like nobody else before. We're on foot, we're in the middle of nowhere, and we're totally alone. And the baboons and the vervet monkeys come and play with us. We get to experience sunsets that are breathtaking and mind-blowing. The Okavanga Delta is one of the last pristine places on the planet. It's a place where the San Bushmen, just to the south in the Kalahari Desert, don't use the constellations that we use in the Northern Hemisphere, but rather the dark parts of the Milky Way, because the stars are so bright there, they can see the Milky Way never, nearly every single night. This big tree in the picture here is a baobab tree. That's about 4,000 years old, and it's made almost 70% of water. One of the other projects that my organization is working on so in the Okavanga Delta, the goal is that we're going to have 150 of those sensors I showed you set up, and volunteers will come and manage those projects. My organization also brings volunteers from all around the world to a place in northeastern Montana called the American Prairie Reserve, a place where it can get negative 20 degrees in the winter and 120 degrees in the summer. But college students, recent college graduates, people who have all different kinds of backgrounds come to battle through MUDs, and hundred-year floods that leave mosquitoes so thick that it looks like we're wearing second pairs of pants while we're up there. And they come to walk these 10 to 12-mile transects every single day simply because they care about giving back. They have the same selfish feeling that I had on the Appalachian Trail, and they want to make a difference for our planet's most special places. So they come to the American Prairie Reserve and collect scientific data. We give them training. These are not people with scientific backgrounds. But anybody can be a scientist. You guys can make a difference for the places that you love by becoming a citizen scientist. We have these uh, tablets that we collect data on that allows us to plot what we're seeing across the prairie in maps like this one. And we can learn from this what kind of grasses antelope are eating or how elk are crossing across this landscape. We can go see the intricate details of the landscape by getting volunteers on the ground. We magnify the ability of the researchers of the American Prairie Reserve to really understand what's going on on the reserves. This is a sage grouse that has collided with the fence. And so we're learning that sage grouse, one of their biggest causes of mortality, is that they actually fly into fence lines at low speeds. And we're really magnifying the impact of what these, the reserve team can do. The landmark volunteers are collecting valuable data, which is providing a rich understanding of the habitat and wildlife. And these images were collected from 26 remote cameras that we have stationed across the reserve that collect incredible wildlife images for us in high definition. These are remotely triggered cameras that sense both movement and heat. And so things like that coyote or images like this of an elk, or excuse me, a deer, 
jumping over a fence line, things you just can't capture any other way. One of the most powerful things is that these volunteers, again, they're not scientists, but they're people who have visual skills, they're people who are photographers, they're people who have musical skills, and they come and they, and they are able to greatly magnify the impact that we can have because they become ambassadors for the places that they love to play. They shoot these northern lights videos on the prairie or they can talk about what it's like to sit on a tent platform and see a storm roll up across the prairie and hit their tent platform. That's experiences that you can't get any other way than to be out on these on the ground in these places. Uh, not sure what just happened there. Yeah. So that's my presentation. I'll say that people are all around the world doing this. We send out thousands and thousands of explorers every single year to go out and collect data that's making a difference for the conservation and the protection of these places. And so I'm happy to take questions. Okay, well, Greg, I think I speak for everybody when I say um, the experiences you've had are amazing. The organization you put together is, is brilliant. And uh, let's get um, some questions. So let's go to Mr. Greenfield's class first if you want to ask Greg a few questions. Who wants to go? Hey, Zach, come on up. Hi, my name's Zach. Hey, Zach, how's it going? Good. Um, how long does each trip take? Yeah, it's a great question. They really vary. Sometimes I'll go out for just as short as a couple weeks. Uh, and, you know, it really depends on where we're at and what we're looking for. If there's, like, one place I have to get to to go find a special kind of nest or something like that, it could just take me a week or two to ski across and get there. But then other tracks, like the one that I had in the Andes, took me almost two full years. It took me 22 months uh, while I was out there. So 667 days, each of which were excruciatingly challenging. Hi, my name is Justin. Hey, Justin. How's it going? Good. Um, how many places have you been, and what was your one place you'd love to go back to again? Good question. So I think I've been to about 40 countries, and uh, I've traveled all over the world. Uh, I've been to six continents. I haven't yet been to Antarctica, so I'd love to go to Antarctica someday. Uh, but the place that I think I love the most that I've been is, is the Okavanga Delta, where I showed you the pictures of the hippos and elephants and crocodiles. To me, that is a feeling of stepping back in time 100,000 years ago before people really interfered with, with uh, nature. And when I'm there, I feel part of nature, and I feel like that's one of the most beautiful places on the planet, and I love being there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Chase. Hey, Chase. Uh, go ahead and ask your question again, please. How does the melting of the glaciers affect us here in New Jersey? It's a great question, too. So how does the, the melting of the glaciers affect you in New Jersey? So all around the world, glaciers are melting. But it's not just that the glaciers are melting, but the climate is changing all around the world in general. And so you guys have had pretty bad storms in New Jersey. You know about Hurricane Sandy. And others, those storms are intensifying and getting worse. And all of that starts when the glaciers melt. So because the glaciers melt, it changes the level of the sea. It changes the way that the sea behaves. And because of that, there's storms that are intensifying and coming across the world. Also, your fellow people on this planet, other members of the human race, are going to be living without water. Think about that. In California, we've heard about the drought that we're having, but this is going to be a permanent drought, and unlike anything that's been experienced before, because those people rely on the glaciers for snow or for water. When those glaciers melt, that's where they get their fresh water. And so economies all around the world will change as a result of those glaciers drying up, 
It's going to mean that there's going to be refugees that are going to have to come and find places to live all around the world. And it means that there's going to be significant changes in our lifetimes. Uh, additionally, as those glaciers melt, the sea levels will rise. And you guys have coastline in New Jersey. And so some of those coastlines will become underwater. And, uh, not to, in your lifetime, that will happen. And so, you know, I don't say that to make you fearful. I think that we're really smart as a human species. I think that people like you, Chase, are going to be able to come up with solutions because you guys are thinking about this stuff now. And you're going to be able to come up with solutions that are going to help us live long into the future. But what's most important is that we start to really find ways that we can still get the resources that we need. We can still have things like oil and paper and the things that we use every day, or rather energy and paper, but we need to do that in more responsible ways than we're doing it now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great question and a great answer. Do you have a couple more over there? Do you want to keep going? Yeah, we got a few more. Yeah, why not? Greg, you're still good for time? Yeah, I've got about 10 more minutes. Excellent. Hi, my name is Daniela. Hey, Daniela, how's it going? Good. What kinds of rare animals have you seen? I've gotten this incredible animals. Uh, let's see. Some of my favorites are what's called a waymu. And so this was in South America, and it's about a three-foot-tall deer. Um, so I thought that was really incredible. Um, I loved watching the rhea. So these are greater and lesser rhea, which look like big, like little ostriches. And they run in these packs of 30 or 40 across the plains, and they're just so incredibly beautiful to watch. Um, every time I see lions, I think that they are the most beautiful, incredible animals on the planet. They're so powerful, and they just are the masters of their domain, and I just love watching cats in general. Um, I've gotten to see monkeys and uh, howler monkeys in the Amazon. I saw a six-foot-long otter in the Amazon. I've seen anacondas, uh, electric eels, uh, pink dolphins. I've gotten to see leopards and cheetahs and hyenas. I had a hyena actually take a book out of my hand this last time that I was in the Okavango Delta. It's a great question. Um, when you are when you are adventuring, where are you sleeping, and what material materials do you bring? Yeah, that's a great question too. So almost always, I sleep. With, I have my tent with me. When I can, I try to sleep out under the stars. In Africa, I don't really sleep out under the stars in Africa because I'm a, you know, I don't want animals coming and licking my face. There's a great video. I'll uh, find the video real quick and send you a link to it of a story that happened to me on the Appalachian Trail. And I was sleeping out under the stars that night, and uh, I was. Uh, it was about two o'clock in the morning, and a. Um, let me just copy this link address here. Yeah, so it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I felt what I thought was a dog uh, licking my face. And uh, you guys can click on this video when we're done. I just sent you all the link to it. I felt a dog licking my face, and I opened up my eyes, and I gasped as a moose nostril was this far away from my face. And so it reared up and slammed down on both sides of my head and ran all through our camp and terrorized the whole camp. And so I'm really cautious about where I sleep out in under the stars now. I don't always do that in moose habitat anymore. But generally I'm under a tent, and I've got things like a sleeping bag with me. I try to go pretty light most of the time so that my backpack doesn't get too heavy. But I have some scientific equipment that I carry. I'm almost always taking other people out with me now. So I have things like safety equipment, uh, satellite phone. I always try to carry extra water and water treatment. Book. I love to read while I'm out there. Uh, that's always really good to have. Um, so, yeah, hope that answers your question. Great question. I'm going to sneak one in from my class here. Went over to Del. Okay. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. What's your name? Giselle. Hey, Giselle. Hi. Um, 
Did you come across any hippos on land at night? Yeah, so totally. That's a great question. So hippos love to go up on the islands at night and eat grasses uh, all, all around us. And so I actually woke up one night, and, uh, well, I had two really exciting encounters in the same night. Once, the first one was an elephant was actually unsnapping the clips on my tent with his trunk, and the other was a hippo rubbing against my tent, just slowly rubbing back and forth against my tent. So that was a, a pretty incredible encounter, too. Uh, but, yeah, they come and eat grasses all through us, and, uh, yeah, pretty exciting times. That's cool. <laughs> very, very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah, so we've got about five minutes. Let's go back to Mr. Greenfield, and maybe you can wrap us up with one or two more questions. Would you rather would you um, do the whole trip again? The, uh, the, which one, the South America one? Um, yeah. Yeah, the South America trip was really, really hard, and it took two long years. And now my work is so much more about running my organization. You know, we have 11 full-time employees that work their butts off to make sure that we are a great organization. And uh, my focus is really on that. And so the idea of taking two years now is really, uh, it would be really hard for me to do. And that just means to me that you got to take those opportunities while they happen. And so, you know, as you grow up and you become looking for, you know, what you're going to do after college or uh, sometimes even before college, uh, you got to take those opportunities. And you've got to go explore the world and you have to go seize every chance you get to try something new and be an explorer. You don't have to go to South America to be an explorer. You can do that in your backyard. You just have to pay attention to nature and what's around you. You have to try new things every day and push your boundaries every single day. Uh, because now that you know I have this organization, it really does take a lot of my time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Simon. Hi, nice, Simon. How are you doing? Good. And my question is, how do you feel whenever, when you find whatever you're looking for? That's a great question, too. So, you know, imagine that you're really, really, really working hard for something. I'm sure every one of you guys can relate to this. So whether it's a test that you have coming up that you've studied really, really hard for, or it's a science project that you're working hard to build, or maybe it's on your soccer team or football team, you're really trying to win the game or be the best you can at being in that position. And you work for a long, long time at it. And often my expeditions aren't just the two weeks or to two years that I'm out there, but they take years of planning. Sometimes I'm, I'm actually planning for more than an entire year to get ready to go. And I train mentally, I train physically. And then when I'm out there, it's go time and I have to execute and really make sure that I do a good job. But when I find something I'm looking for, it is the most incredible feeling of success and, and it makes me feel so proud of myself that I've gotten there and done that. And it also makes me feel so proud of my team because almost always it takes a team to succeed. I can't be doing these things alone. Um, I know my friends at National Geographic, guys like Lee Berger who just discovered Homo Nodelli, uh, the new... Uh, the new uh, um, the new hominid that was basically a pre-human, he had a whole team to go in and get those for him because he couldn't do them by himself. And that's just the case always. And so I'm really proud of my team. I feel part of a group. I feel just so proud. And that happens even when I just hike, if I'm trying to get to the summit of something. But what I love about science and what I love about giving people scientific missions is that they tell us time and time again that instead of just trying to get to the summit, they were looking for the right track or a specimen of something we're collecting, and that can be equally as important and equally as exciting. Okay, so I think we're going to have to wrap up the questions there. That was a great set of questions. Um, Greg does have to run. He's hopping on a plane for another adventure. So, um, Greg, if I can say, I mean... Amazing presentation. Your work's awesome. And looks like Mr. Greenfield wants to say something. Here he is. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys. We have uh, 
two classes in here who enjoyed the presentation, and uh, good luck on your next journey. We hope to hear back from you. Yeah, thank you guys all for being here, and just don't forget that you can all be explorers. You can all go push your boundaries every day, and don't be afraid to try new things. It's okay if you fail. You just got to keep going. All right. Great message. So what I'll do is I'll get the microphones back on, and I'll get the classrooms just to say goodbye, to say thank you. So thanks, Greg. All right, signing off. Yeah, thanks, guys. See you soon.